come join us as we dive deeper behind the scenes of security and cybercrime today, interviewing top leaders from around the world and sharing true cybercrime stories to raise awareness. But first, a huge thank you to all of our executive co-producers who subscribed to our Prime membership and fueled our growth. So please help us keep this going by subscribing for free to our YouTube channel and downloading our episodes on Apple or Spotify podcasts so we can continue to bring you more of what matters. This is Cybercrime Junkies, and now, the show. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Cybercrime Junkies. I am your host, David Morrow. In the studio today is my illustrious and always positive co-host, Mark Mosher, Mark. How are hey, you? David. How are you? I'm really excited about today's episode. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I a lot am of good, too. good material. It, while it is common that you and I are not the smartest guys in the room, this today will certainly one of those shining bar. examples. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> we're joined by federal CTO for Intel, Steve Oren. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks, David and Mark. It's a pleasure to be here today. Yeah. And for those that may not have an, any idea of who Intel is. Um, if you use a PC, uh, you're using components that are part in manufactured in part by Intel. Uh, they're one of the global, um, really think tanks and uh, cons consultative uh, leaders in the technology space and have been for over 50 years. Um, uh, Mr. Oren is a recognized security leader, a public speaker. Uh, he's orchestrated and executed projects for the federal government customers on security, AI, um, inferencing, and edge ISR. Um, he serves as a key advisor and subject matter expert in emerging technologies, um, providing guidance to the public sector, the defense, and the intelligence communities. So we are really honored to have you here, Steve. So. Thank um, thank you so much. Um, first let's start off. You know, how did you as you were going through school and then beginning the the your career uh in technology, how what led you to the cybersecurity space? Can you walk our listeners through that? Sure, Dave. It's an interesting story. Uh going back to when I first started uh looking at, you know, what did I want to be when I grew up, you know, when mm -hmm. you know, I had to pick a direction in college. Um my background, I enjoyed the sciences was a hacker as a kid. And at the time in the in late 80s, there really wasn't a career uh, to be had in the security or in the technology right. domain. Um, I could become a COBOL programmer. And at that time, there were a lot of uh, problems with the, you know, the industry, a, a glut of programmers. So I went the bio route actually, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, got a degree in research biology, did some graduate research. And it just happened that uh, when my, one of my grants had run out and we were, I was thinking about the, the things I was going to do before starting med school, um, a friend of a friend had an idea that he wanted to do something in this internet space that everyone was talking about in the early 90s. And uh, he said, well, you, you're a hacker as a kid. You know this stuff. You want to help? And I'm like, you know what? This sounds like something I could do for a year, help put some money away from med school. Sure, I, I'll do this for a year. And we're talking 95, 94, 95, pre-Netscape IPO. It was the exactly. days. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and yeah. And <laughs> I had the opportunity to help found a company that was doing desktop security. And after three months, I just fell in love. I was all in. I, uh, I had some really good mentors, both at that company and my follow-on. Um, I like to joke that I suck their brains dry. <laughs> um, That's but great. I had people like Bruce Schneier and others as my mentors wow. to help me get started. Oh, yeah and yeah. really guide me along the paths and uh you know it took a little while for the you know for my family to recognize that i wasn't just going crazy because you know why are you throwing away your medical career here? Yeah, I, I could i can hear that i can hear the family dinner right now. right, yes. right? Um, you're, you're doing this computer thing it's just a fad it's just it's, a fad. It's, go it's back into pass. medicine it's it's a pass. Pass. and what's the security thing like that's even smaller oh yeah uh, especially but, back then it wasn't even it wasn't a thing it wasn't a thing it wasn't really a thing. it's it, Hey everyone, as you know, we routinely discuss how risky it is for brands to rely just on passwords or weak old-fashioned multi-factor authentication systems. It's your brand and we want you to protect it. 
Today, we're excited to be sponsored by a next generation authentication platform beyond identity. Did you know 80% of breaches are the result of stolen credentials? Why does your organization still rely on passwords as part of your authentication process? Beyond Identity enforces continuous risk-based authentication, a fundamental tenet of a zero trust security program. Check the link in our show notes and go to beyondidentity.com slash podcast to get a free demo. That's beyondidentity.com slash podcast to get a free demo. Beyondidentity.com slash podcast for a free demo today. Or simply click the link in our show notes below. And now the show. It was the beginning and it was uh, it was exciting times. And so I started uh, my first, you know, did that first company in 95, then started my own company in 98 and uh, did a bunch of startups. And, you know, I, I considered myself a serial entrepreneur in the cybersecurity space. Uh, helping to start the web security market with Sanctum, XML security mm-hmm. with Sarvega, did the mainframe security thing with Lockstar, mm-hmm. and then got acquired by Intel back in 2005. And uh, by that little company, the startup Intel. guy inside Yeah, that Intel. little startup Intel. That yeah. little, <laughs> yeah, the little startup. <laughs> the little startup. But it's interesting. You mentioned that Intel has been at the foundation of technology for the past 50 years. And one of the things, as a serial entrepreneur and a cybersecurity guy, um, I found that I, you know, over the over my career, and I've been there now 18 years. I still get to do innovative things on a regular basis. Yeah, um, the, it's great when a larger organization allows those creative licenses to happen. Right? Exactly, exactly. And I sort of get to play CTO, you know, in the security when I was doing the security job uh, earlier in my career there at Intel, you know, with Intel's budget. So I didn't have to go to VCs. That made life a lot oh, easier. That makes a whole <laughs> makes, lot of difference, right? Yeah. There. Easier to make an impact. <laughs> exactly. That's uh, that's phenomenal. So one of the things that has been just, it's been coming up in a lot of episodes lately, and that is, why is it there's so much focus now on security? It seems it's in the news every day, more so than it was even five years ago, let alone 10 years ago. Um, and we know it, a lot of it has to do with the cyber crime industry is productized. They've gotten organized, clearly well-funded. But why have so many security solutions over time just failed to protect organizations? And maybe that bodes a, diff- a bigger question. But what's your what's your take on what you're seeing on, at a macro level? So, Dave, I wish there was an easy answer to yeah. why uh, security solutions and the security industry continually seems to be, let's call it, failing. I think that the, the part of the challenges we're looking at it somewhat from a whack-a-mole kind of perspective. Yeah. Right? You have this security problem, we solve it with that security product. You have this security problem, mm-hmm. we solve it with that security product. And as we're realizing now, security is a systemic thing. It's mm-hmm. understanding all the different weakest links in the chain, all the different ways an attacker can get in and making the best decisions with a risk-based approach as opposed to I've got to just sort of peanut butter my entire enterprise. Right. It, it's, it's really not binary. It's really not. I, and, and I think perhaps that question was a bad question because it's really not that it's failed. It's a matter of risk degree exactly. and what what level of risk. It's almost like a dial, like some startups or some entrepreneurs are like, they'll, they'll have that risk dial all the way up maybe, right? Depending on what their startup is based on. And then some other ones that are really worried in manufacturing, let's say, or healthcare or whatever, they're really worried about production going down. They'll start dialing up their security posture more to lower that risk. Absolutely. And I think what's interesting is even in those risk-based environments where you focus on what are my highest risk things and I apply security to those areas, the realization is that there's still other holes, other gaps mm-hmm. in right. security posture. Yep. And as we've always said in the security industry, we've got to get it right 100% of the time. The hacker has to get it right just once. Correct. Yep. And I think that's that sort of dynamic of I'm not, I don't want to say that the security solutions have failed. They probably all have worked for the things they were applied to. Right. It's the enterprise security of my organization. Did I, did I meet, you know, if I was a CISO or a CIO, did I meet the security bar, you know, the bar that I've set? Right. And even in those cases, you're never a hundred percent. And that's where you have compensating controls, whether it be disaster recovery, backup, mm-hmm. And other things, Just continuity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you know you're going to get attacked, and the question is, how fast did you get back up and running? Yeah, or yeah. how much data made it out the door? 
And I think what we're seeing with people transitioning and, and the cybersecurity framework from NIST really highlighted the need for transitioning from a, you know, let me just do an analysis approach of well, how, what security tools do I have according to the, you know, the quad chart du jour to a risk-based approach that can evolve. And I think that was one of the key things that the CSF highlighted is that it's not a point in time. I've got this decision, right. I pay some money, I get my products and I'm good. It's how does my risk change across time and that I need to adjust my security controls to meet that ever changing threat landscape. Yeah, that's 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 really good. That, that, well, it's almost that, like we're a step behind. It feels like we're a step behind. Is there their techniques and tactics change? It's you know we're chasing mm-hmm. what, what the next evolution is of a threat actor. Then then they change, and then we got to go chase the next one. And you know, so yeah, I don't think it's so much that it, these platforms and, and tools that we've come out with. It, yeah, I've really failed to, to your point, Steve. It's it's the threat landscape continues to change all the time and you're right what what's your level appetite for risk exactly and how do we i think one of the things we're seeing some trends here uh, and we'll probably bring it up later with zero trust but i think the other trend to think about is moving away from closing vulnerability gaps to get to actually looking at the overall security and risk environment and really taking out whole areas of risk and i think what we're you know whether that be certain Take- technologies that can sort of close whole mm-hmm. vulnerability types as opposed to patching individual vulnerabilities or even like and I'll pick on the the supply chain security as an example everyone's talking about SBOM and like well how will SBOM save save me one thing it gives you is it gives you earlier access to information so that you can start making decisions quicker and so instead so- of it just waiting to patch the product that you found out was vulnerable what controls could I turn on now while I wait for the vendor to patch the product because I know I have a vulnerability and start dialing up my you know firewalls or my intrusion detection or my monitoring or locking down services and basically with that visibility that that uh, gives you the, the the chance to get ahead of the curve and that's what I think the shift we're seeing is looking at your supply chain looking at how do we change the way we authenticate and authorize transactions it isn't about well I know I have this lateral move vulnerability or I have this buffer overflow it's how do I take the knees out of the adversary by not giving them the landing zone, not giving them the six months of window of exposure to exactly. log4j gets patched? That's right. where I think we're starting to see those shifts is moving away from the, I must patch everything, which we should, but to a, how do I close whole areas of, of risk? Right. Yeah, just, it's it's more impactful. It's 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 a broader scale level of protection though. Well, uh, you mentioned SBOM. Could you elaborate on that for, for the listeners that might, that might not be following things as closely as we are? Sure, and so the SBOM is really the convergence of a variety of things coming on. SBOM stands for Software Bill of Materials. Right. Um, and what, at its core, what it is, is, is a, you know, an ingredient list for, for the black box that is the software you're using, whether that is a commercial product from your operating system or, or application provider, or an open source tool or framework you're getting online, how do you know what's in the box? And you think about it, you go buy a package of cereal, it has a list of ingredients. You know that there's gonna be you know rice or wheat and there'll be some corn syrup or whatever you- And you know whether there's an allergy to one of those exactly. ingredients so you can gauge your risk. And if you find out that you're allergic to something, you can identify it. Right. And if something comes out in the future, it says, you know, this chemical or this, you know, ret, you know, dye number five has got an issue. You can go look at the package and say, oh, it has dye number five. And that's what happened to you, Moshe. As a kid. Uh, no, no I happened. ate a lot of, I ate a lot of uh, paint chips. Yes. <laughs> Turns out it was lead paint too. Who that's, knew? That's, that's, that's <laughs> what I'm thinking. Yeah. Sorry about that, Steve. We no just worries. To... No worries. So you think about the software, it's the same idea. It identifies all the key components, their version numbers mm-hmm. uh, and information about it so that you have really an itemized asset inventory for your software. Now, there's two things that happen. Number one, I have this in my, I can make better acquisition decisions by doing risk analysis, by looking up what CVEs exist for this software, right. what you know, is the history of patching for this software. So you can get better visibility into what you do before you deploy it, but also for the stuff you're managing, it allows you to manage the risk by having that knowledge. So in the past, if you had a software product in your environment and a vulnerability is disclosed in, let's say, a component like Log4j or CodeCob, reality is you have no idea whether your organization is vulnerable until the vendor tells you 
oh <laughs> yes, we have this vulnerability and oh, here's the patch will come in six weeks or six right. months or whatever. Right. If they even tell you before the patch is ready. Or in the case of that Barracuda device where they're like, we can't even patch it. You have to replace it. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Which just like people in the community were just, they hadn't <laughs> seen that for before. Yeah. So they were like, wow, okay. So, um, and so what SBOM will do is give you that list, but then when you tie it into your uh, your your security operations into CVEs, there's a, a format that's been put out called VEX, which is a way to validate mm -hmm. the vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. What that allows you to do is to get that insight so that when the log for J2.0 comes out as vulnerable, right. number one, day one, you can check all of your software. What has log for J2.0? And, yeah. all yeah. Of them. Yeah. and even if they're not all vulnerable, because that's what some analysis is going to be. You can immediately know that there's a potential risk and what extra controls and monitoring do I need? If you know you have, let's say, a web server product with that module, you can, I mean, you can take the draconian mode and just uninstall it. Not everyone has that luxury. Right. But you can apply different monitoring. Monitor mm -hmm. this thing, see if there's additional ports being open, see if there's different traffic, if there's new accounts being, you can monitor it like because you have this extra information you can minimize your risk until the patch comes out. And that is a game changer as far as how we apply security controls. Whereas in the past, it's always been that whack-a-mole of vulnerability discovered. Hopefully you get a patch in time before the exploit is discovered. And then you have to roll out that patch across your organization. This gives you much earlier time to reducing the risk. Why we're doing this now? Well, after Solar Winds and some other uh, pretty uh, public supply chain events, there was an move executive it, order. The, 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 the move it compromise. The, right? That's a recent one. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, ex the, uh, the Biden administration put on an executive order, 14028, which had a lot of key, key statutes in there about cyber information sharing. One of the key ones was the need for increasing our supply chain security, mm -hmm. directing key government agencies to come up with standards. So uh, DSH, sorry, DHS, CISA, has been working mm -hmm. with the ITAA to create the SBOM standard and the sub, you know, the formats like SPDF and others that will go into it. And then directing OMB, and this is one of the key things, actually directing the, the Office of Management Budget to update contract language, to require oh. SBOMs as part of any software that is being acquired by the federal government. That's, that's a make um, that's makes sense thinking right there. Yeah, wow. So it's not just to have a good standard, but enforce it. Now here's the best part. The government is a large enough acquirer of software, both open source and commercial, that it drives this so that the ecosystem, the, the Microsoft, the private Intel, sector, everybody, the other smaller entities can start to, to adapt. do that. And then everyone else gets the benefit. So you have an mm -hmm. S bomb that's created because you know XYZ company Acme is selling software to the DOD. Well, then Citibank or any other bank or any regional bank can request that same SBOM because it's already been built. So the investment was already done. This so it raises yeah. the bar across the board. Yeah, this seems so logical. And it seems like like a, a massive asset inventory that I'm curious what you think. Don't you think the non-technical decision makers were operating under an assumption that this was already in place? To, to, to some degree, to didn't some they degree. think you guys are running the security stuff? I, you, I'm, you know I'm sure you know what on, you right? have, right? You think, although, I mean, you can ask any executive, do you know what's inside your iPhone? Or they your have Android? no idea. Exactly. No idea. Nobody has any idea. And that's what's, what's true of all software. It's very yeah. rare, even in open source, that you had the real visibility into all the it's components. True. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people just sort of assumed, well, I'll have my firewall will catch that. My antivirus will deal with that. Right. And it won't. Um, That's symptomatic. Now, it's yeah. not the root cause. Exactly. Now, I don't want to minimize the complexity of it, that SBOM introduces. These aren't like little text files. These could be mm -hmm. thousand line documents because right. most modern software is very complex, has mm -hmm. components that are nested of components. Their supply chains are fairly rich. And then there's a lot of dependencies. And so, you know, there was a, there's a great uh, on GitHub, they have an example of a common S bomb and it is like 1400 lines long. Um, oh. Now it's human readable if you so desire, but the real innovation will be where the, the tooling and the, and the asset management and supply chain management and vulnerability management software can apply automated processes for consuming the S bomb, populating databases and, and control matrices with the information. That's the, 
the, the key transformation of how do you scale this from a really cool artifact that you'll get a mm -hmm. checkbox, yes, I hand you pass bomb, to how mm -hmm. do I operationalize it and scale it with an organization, we're going to need tools. And whether that be your existing enterprise management tools taking on this function, you're going to see a lot of startups that are in the security and the manageability space add SBOM. I mean, you already see it throughout most of the industry today. And I honestly think there's going to be a cottage industry of new startups that are going to uh, enable you to both consume and operational SBOM integrated into your existing and legacy controls and really sort of take it to the next level. We'll see a lot of innovation because this really becomes a whole new set of data to operate against. Oh, that Absolutely. makes sense. That's why I was going to ask you, because that makes perfect sense that in this vacuum as this takes off, that it's by its own nature will create those small niche startups to supply that. How do you take the data? How do you consume it? And then how do you leverage it all in one space? You know, maybe even a single pane of glass, you know, how? So there's uh, that's that's going to be really cool to watch that in. Yeah. So all you. the VCs watching this episode, just keep your eye on, on this. Um, <laughs> They're all right, taking notes. Oh, really? Yeah. Tell me more about that. Steve. And like yeah. the phrase AI, every startup will have S bomb in their in their and name within its within right? its charter. That's yeah. Just the beginning. Or, we're going to have AI applied to S bomb in order to be able to better identify risk. We oh, can see it now we're exactly. now we're cooking with gas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can see. So are we seeing it right now? What are you seeing? Like, what industries are you seeing? Mostly in supply chain. So the industries that you'll see, I think where I've already seen commitments publicly from all the major software provid providers to okay. supply SBOM to their government customers to meet the executive order mandates. Because the nice thing about the executive order, nice thing from an industry security, a little bit of pain on the vendor is they put a deadline in there. They said, we want to, right. by the end of the fiscal, we want to start seeing SBOMs on contract. They've given some. Otherwise, leeway. you don't get the bid, right? Yeah, right. Otherwise, you won't get yeah. the bid. So there's some grandfathering. There's, you know, again, it's not going to be draconian, but we're already starting to see the requests come from the the agencies that are sort of want to be on the the, the front end of this, asking for S bombs as their software acquisition. Um, so that that part is driving us forward. I think what we're starting to see is you go to like GitHub and some of these open source communities. They've already built not only the S bomb for the you know as as an exemplar, but there are already tools that are being developed to do automated creation of S bomb. So as you're building your open source widget, you can right. run a tool at the end that will capture the information and publish right. it in the right format. So this whole sort of open that source ecosystem is coming online mm -hmm. to make it easier for developers. Similarly, ESF, uh, which is a collaboration between the federal government and industry, has published guidance targeted at the developer community the supplier community and the customer or the, the consumer of software from an enterprise or government perspective of how to do this, not just in you know the format, but how to oper actually operationalize, how to build the processes, what are the best practices to make this stuff real. And so those documents have been published over the last year, really helping organizations go look to a collaborative environment. So it's industry, it's government working together to say, okay, this is the standard, but this is actually how you make it work. And, how you know some best guy you know some best practices and guidance of what to do and not to do. That's that's amazing. And so, um, is this tied in any way to um, uh, Jen Easterly's uh, recent comments about how we can't PSA PSA our way out of this? You know, she she was she was talking about how um, you know we we can't PSA our way out of. Uh, cyber vulnerability. She was talking about how we've got to um, push a little more responsibility on the private sector to kind of develop that. Is that kind of tied to this, do you think? So I think the SBOM activity, while separate from that conversation, is an exemplar of the okay. kind of effort sense. Um, that's necessary. And again, it's industry government collaboration. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's driving sort of mandate but also driving the the initiative. Why do I want to do this? Well, I want to be able to get government contracts. I want to be able to sell my stuff to right. the government, and I want to be able to ease my transition. You know, to be able to do that. And so at the same time, and also want to give the vendor better visibility to what's in their products. I can imagine a lot of companies may you know individuals in the company may know what's inside the product, right. but at the sort of the build or the last phase, do they know all the components that came in before you ever got to the compile? Right, right. And That's is it documented question. anywhere? Like, is there a central yeah. 
Huh. Is there a central document that actually has everything from start to finish? And generally, no, right? Because it lives in the culture or in the minds of the people doing different pieces up exactly. until now. Exactly. And that's something I think a lot of uh, uh, organizations, big and small, will benefit from downstream as they get better at understanding. One of the, the use cases was talked about is just getting a better understanding of the licenses that are in these software products from a mm -hmm. compliance perspective. Um, most large organizations have lots of lawyers and, and working together with software developers, make sure they're doing the right thing. Smaller, medium and startup companies are just trying to get the product out the door. The SVAL may be a nice tool to help them keep track of what they've got so that they're not violating a GPL or somebody's commercial third party license. And it, again, it's sort of this uh, secondary value of just having, having that, that artifact list um, and the ingredient list with the correlating data. Uh, it's going to help in a lot of areas, not just, you know, security. That's that's amazing. We were talking earlier about uh, zero trust. Um, I would love to hear your take on some of the ways that you feel it's been effectively implemented in organizations and where you think it's it's become a buzzword that is at the it's contained in a lot of different products and services yes. that are out there. David, the answer is yes. I've seen both. Um, I think we're at the you know the hype curve, if you will, for zero trust. <laughs> exactly. Um, it is definitely. If you went to RSA, I think every booth had zero trust someplace yep. in there. That's what I was mentioning. That's what, was mentioning. <laughs> That's what we were talking about. Uh, so I, I definitely think that we've we've hit that critical mass of it's on everyone's mind. I think one thing to keep in mind is that zero trust isn't a product, right? Nor is exactly. it a technology or even a process. It's a it's a I mean, I like to think of it as, as a philosophy. It's an approach to yep. things. It's how you do everything you've been doing before, mm -hmm. um, which was the other key part of it, or actually two key parts. One, it's a journey. It's not a destination. You don't mm -hmm. achieve zero trust and then done. It's mm -hmm. how do I do my activities in a zero trust way as I do all the things I'm supposed to do and continually improve. The other thing that people may not realize is that this isn't a revolution. It's not like, oh, throw everything out you did before and let's do zero trust instead. It's actually a natural evolution of where, you know, of where we've gotten to in the cybersecurity industry. Mm -hmm. If you think back to the early days, well, we, we did things like, you know, sort of specific controls for specific problems, firewalls for networks, antivirus for desktop. Like we had all these different yep. regimes and they started to get out of hand. And so then we started having things like SIM that allowed me to collect the data. Then we had orchestration so I can actually operate it. Like all these things were stepping stones. The key thing that happened, the two things that started happening, one, when we got to this risk-based approach. So suddenly I needed to think about the risk of my op organization, my risk appetite and apply things in a risk fashion. So that, whether it be the cybersecurity framework from NIST, the risk management framework from DOD, or any one of the hundred other ways of going about a risk-based approach to security, really started to put it in that it wasn't, I need a firewall or not. It's what's the right security for this problem for my threat at this moment understanding that it could change. And that shift in mindset set the stage for zero trust. So first step is, can I apply a proper risk protocol and risk framework or matrix to my organization? The other key evolution was understanding a maturity model, that it's not about a binary, did I get security or not? It's how mature is my organization for the controls I can apply? And again, it's the idea of a journey. You take those two things in parallel, when you get to zero trust, what zero trust just basically says, everything you just did is correct. Now let's just stop trusting everyone implicitly. And that's right. really at the core of what zero trust is, is a set of, of mechanisms so that when Mark logs in in the morning, he's not just auto trusted as Mark for every aspect of his transaction. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, we get back to the idea of defense and depth that evolves. And that's really what zero trust is. It's defense and depth with an idea that you're not trusted. You're not automatically good. Not saying you're automatically bad, but you're just untrusted. And so I need to verify right. every aspect of, is this the right thing to do at this moment? And then when you, so that's the defense in depth with the zero trust angle. And then the risk space means that tomorrow there's a new risk, a new threat. My risk changes. So that means my security must change. Yep. Now, without having to go rip out everything you've done, what zero trust allows you to do in that dynamic environment is because I don't trust anyone, I don't have to go and redo my security if the threat You just changes. have to let them in one at a time after it's been yeah, verified. Exactly. And so if my threat level changes, I can apply new security controls. You're already being re-authenticated, so I don't have to 
kick you out and start over, the next time you come in, I may have a different level of, of, of security for what you're, you're trying to do. And that's the, how these things marry together. So I think the key is that it's an evolution mm -hmm. towards this, this new concept. Now, in three years, we'll have another buzzword because that's the cycle we always go through. That's, yeah. that's kind of where it works, right? Um, but we're, I think what we're seeing We're looking is, forward to Black Hat this year with, the, <laughs> with, with whatever the new, new buzzword. buzzword for the next three years. And let's also face the fact that once zero trust gets you know beyond the early stages and starts to get rolled out and scaled, mm -hmm. we're going to identify. There's you know the hackers aren't going to go to you know close up shop and become you know and and start uh, going legit. They're going to look no, for it's places not like, to no, go it's, after. Yeah, it's not like Lockbit Green is sitting there going, "Oh, they've got zero trust. We better we better open up an e-commerce store now." Yeah, and, we, yeah, better, we better shut do down these activities. Different. And so what no. we see is zero trust moving from today. It's very focused on what I call the transactional models. Correct. You know, so I authenticate in to is get a file. Similar, to, yeah. Is it similar in some ways to like PAM, like privilege access management where like, yeah, you might have authority to do something, but we're going to regulate, you know, this role in this organization can't access all this other stuff. Cause so many organizations I find, you know, when I think about like some of the recent breaches that have been in the news, okay. Yeah. They might've, socially engineered them and got access, or they might have done even multi-factor authentication fatigue and got access. But once they had control over that employee, they, the, ha the threat actors were able to find amazing access that that employee themselves didn't even didn't know. Didn't even know that they had. Yeah. And so it, it wasn't configured right in the first place. They, they were There was way too much access given to, it was very horizontal. Yeah, I mean, again, is that we need is that zero trust. Trust. exactly we need to take away that implicit trust exactly in employees or in an in, entity by the way everyone focuses on the human i right. need multi-factor authentication for all my users entities are just as much to a part of the story software applications are mostly autonomous now they, they may be operating on behalf of a query that you did david but that web server querying that database may not have your credential even they may just have a token associated with an authentication event that happened two hours ago. That's part of why the zero trust has to go even deeper than just users is not implicitly trusting. Well, the web server is inside, so it must be secure. The database is inside, so it must be secure. It's shifting that oh, whole conversation. Interesting. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's not even a, so not even trusting certain systems to speak with other systems and access other systems. You need to verify those as well. Yeah, and one of the things, you know, and this is a conversation I have pretty often with uh, CISOs and CIOs in the government space. Um, they often ask, well, you know, you've, we, we talk about the zero trust, it's in the mandate, I gotta do it. Where do I begin? And everyone immediately jumps right. on the multi-factor because that's something tangible I can buy. I can I can put tokens on everyone's hands. So that's- yeah, That comes big, in a big. box, I know how to do that. Yeah, we that. know how to do that. It can't be sophisticated if, if we know how to do it. If, yeah. Um, if, if Mosher things, and I can figure that out. One of the things I, I recommend is uh, as another set of controls that are really powerful in the zero trust world is network segmentation, micro segmentation. Right. Micro segmentation. Like getting beyond the big areas of, of, of domains down to very small knowable sections. So I can apply security controls, policy and access in and out for very small areas. So that when something does get compromised and it invariably will, Mm -hmm. I'm really limited the scope of that lateral movement to one system, one small group of systems. And then you marry that with another concept that I talk about, which is called threat canaries. So What's a lot that? of, so a lot of organizations have, you know, a variety of history of, of systems. They have laptops that may be anywhere from one to five years old. They may have software operating systems that are legacy or not updated all the time because of certain compatibility issues. And what a threat canary is, is you take a modern, like state-of-the-art system with all the security controls on it, all the, the virus, the intrusion detection, all the different sensors turn to 11. You put it in that vi environment, not as a honeypot. You give it to somebody, you give it to a developer, you give it to a secretary, you give it to an executive in that domain, or you put it underneath that database and you turn all the dials to 11 and it becomes your canary in the coal mine for that micro segment. Okay. And that oh, way I see what you're saying. And that way, so, if something does get compromised, you don't have to wait till it ex exfills out of that environment to have a sensor go off. And so it's, it's almost like those deception two together is really yeah. how you get ahead. That's almost like a the the deceptive movement, right? Like that's almost like an element of deception where Except they. I'm not decepting. I'm actually right. giving you like think about it. If I gave if you gave your uh, 
your top developer, the best laptop you could buy with all the security controls turned to 11, they're doing real work. And not, you're not deceiving anyone. He's actually right. developing yeah. it. She's developing code and loading it to Git and right. everything else. But behind the scenes, you've got a system that's not legacy, that's not old operating system, that has all the sensors. So when a malware tries to access that or a hacker who's on one, one of the other systems in that micro segment tries to jump over, his it's gonna it's gonna sensors, pick it up exactly pick it up. and this one of the reasons why this is important is that very few organizations have the budget to wipe out everything and start over mm -hmm. so it's very hard to say well just go upgrade all your hardware upgrade all your software get the latest patch version for everything I, we know reality isn't there and it, even if i had that budget it take me six you know two years to do that just rollout. to build it out <laughs> yeah exactly but being able to pick one system in each of those uh, micro segments and say this is going to be my you know, my, my, my sensor, if you will. And it's not a, as a honeypot or deception where just sort of hanging out, wait, because if it's not doing anything, it's going to get bypassed because they're, they're right. know that. But if it's the system that's actually doing fun stuff, they're going to want to try to attack it. And that will be your early, early warning system, if you will. So mirroring those two things together. So obviously multi-factor that has to happen, but micro segmentation with active sensors in those segments, that gets you really far down the, the the beginner's path on your journey towards zero trust. Everything else then is becomes, you know, operational management, visibility, you know, like a lot of the more mature things that take mm -hmm. time to do. And this way you have a good baseline to build off of. So how is, this is excellent, that and that the threat canaries was, I love that concept. And, and I, you, you're seeing it implemented in at the federal level when, people are, are beginning to mature on their journey toward, exactly. toward, toward, toward zero trust. What do, what do SMBs do? You know, in, in the SMB space, when they don't want to think about security, right? They want to like have their manufacturing, they're building auto parts for cars. They want to just do their business, but they're getting these attacks and they want their company not to go under they want not to be in the news they want not to have their production shut down from a massive ransomware attack like what do, can how realistic is it for them to can to begin on the journey of zero trust i believe personally that they can and they should it's just a matter of how do they do it like would you would you suggest you know begin with smaller things like multi-factor authentication or incident response planning, like some tabletops or something like that? So it's a good question, David. And I think it, it's a, a little bit of, of what you just said and a, a little bit more. SMBs aren't going to have the budget or the infrastructure necessary right. to employ a lot of tools and a lot of management. And they're going to have a very small cyber team, if any. Right. One thing they can do is you know, they're often they're using managed services, whether it be cloud mm -hmm. hosting, even their security is often managed by somebody else, mm -hmm. requiring that those managed providers provide them with the zero trust capabilities in those clouds, in that managed service. And they can, by the way, all the cloud providers are gonna have tools and things in there to provide zero trust. So if you've outsourced a lot of your IT operations because you are too small to have a, a dedicated team, you can get, it doesn't mean you don't get zero trust. You can get it from your hosted providers. You just have to ask for it. And Got similarly, it. interesting, and and, similarly, and and at the level that balances turning the dial down to the point where they're comfortable with the risk, but it doesn't interfere with production, right? Risk management, exactly. Yep. Making a risk determination: what is the risk to my organization? It's you know availability, threat, you know, it's all those things, mm -hmm. and applying the right controls for your environment. It doesn't mean that a small regional bank has to have the same level of security as a as a global bank. That being said, they're both targeted. So this right. is this is an opportunity. Number one, leveraging hosting providers and cloud providers to provide you those as a service capabilities at a, a cheaper rate than building it out yourself. Mm -hmm. Following the best practices, because by the way, for the banking industry, the banking ISAC is going to have best practices right. that they can adopt. They don't have to start from square one. Mm -hmm. And then one thing we've seen in a lot of these, you know, sort industrial, you know, the industry and vertical communities is, and this goes to that other point that Easterling was pointing out better information sharing. Right. And so oh, yeah. what we've already seen the benefit of, of the large banks sharing with the smaller banks, the smaller banks get the benefit of all the TTPs and all the information that the big banks with all their mm -hmm. sensors can see. The big banks got a really interesting side benefit from those early information sharing uh, and IOC sharing activities. Many of the hacker groups would 
beta test their attacks on small regional banks. That's what I was, I was about to ask. Oh, and yeah. yet they, so w w once they start they, sharing the they, other they know they don't have the the exactly. funding to have all of the defenses and they don't have their own internal SOC team and all the threat hunters and all that. And so they can target them first. And that's what they were doing. That. And so mm. what the large banks were able to get is early indicators from the from the regional banks and they were then able to start to lock down those things well in advance. So the collaboration was actually mutual. One of the studies that was done, they, they did an, a pilot experiment to share cross industry. So banking to healthcare. Mm -hmm. And again, they saw this really interesting dynamic where stuff that was happening in the banking community would eventually make its way over into healthcare. And so the healthcare community got wow. at, got that benefit of seeing things that had started as a, you know, targeting banks. And then on the flip side, a lot of the, the, the attacks that we're looking at and research that was being done on medical devices or on, you know, that's called the OT systems. Right. Banks, you think of banks as being all IT, but ATMs are OT. And so right. a lot of other aspects of their operations. And so again, there was some really good collaboration of understanding the threat landscapes that they were that were very much popular in the medical device industry and only just coming to the financial services operational side of the camp. So I think one of the things that the executive order and Easterly and others are really highlighting is we need more of that. We need more information sharing cross industry, government to industry, because the tools and technologies are great, but if we're not doing a good job of communicating amongst mm -hmm. ourselves, we're, we're doing us all a disservice. Absolutely. We have to, of course, create a safe environment for doing that. You don't want people getting sued because I, I exposed that we had been, you know, somebody had been attacked. And similarly, you don't want to have someone be able to use that against you in, you know, in, in the court of public opinion. And so, well, and, I, and I think that's an important part here, right? Because some of the hesitation in the past has been, litigation, risk, liability, right? They don't want to say, here's how we were exposed or here's how we can be exposed because then it could open them up to public scrutiny as well as civil liability. Exactly. And so there's been uh, mechanisms put in place to help protect from a liability protection. Yeah, safe in the, harbors. Especially in the, the like cyber uh, information sharing vulnerability disclosure mm -hmm. requirements. Mm -hmm. They have, uh, there, there are provisions in there to protect organizations of lawyers can be you know get get at least a, a warm fuzzy on that mm -hmm. side and then the other is that there's uh industry collaboration and government collaboration groups where you can anonymize the data so that you can expose hey this is how they attack this is what happened not necessarily to abc to company or right, organization. exactly excellent because really the government doesn't need to know that bank xyz was hacked they really want to know that it was you know fuzzy bear doing this kind of ransomware attack again right and that's the information that's important and so that yeah. having that ability to anonymize the data sets and be able to provide it in a safe place for analysis and this is again a good place where a lot of the the service providers can play a role a, a single managed security service provider may see hundreds if not thousands of client systems of clients yeah. systems and be mm -hmm. able to aggregate that data to the federal government or to other uh, sharing environments so that you don't, you know, call out any one player as being the one that got host. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, and I, it, it seems like that's a lot less, it, it seems like that judgment is happening less often now uh, than it did a few years back. A few years back, you know, when certain brands got hit, everyone's like, oh, I can't believe they got hit. And then it's become so commonplace that we're all like, can we learn a from this exactly like and what can we learn from this and let's not blame the internal security team over there because but for the grace of god would it be us right so let's let's learn from this together because we're all kind of against the same enemies here yeah and one of the things that was really interesting about the ransomware attacks from a couple of years ago i mean everyone talked about capital pipeline and yeah big and big industrial environment you know, ot systems affected yeah I thought that the most interesting one from a from just understanding the change in our environment was JBS, the, uh, uh, the, yeah, the meat the packing food. out of Australia. Yeah, yep. there are two things you can learn from that. Number one, there is no industry that is immune from being right. attacked because let's face it, meat packing is not necessarily the sexiest industry. No, that is not something that would be on the list. You would think. Oh. exactly. Yeah. The other side of that is that just how reliant every aspect of our lives is on digital technology. Yeah. Meatpacking had to shut down because there was a ransomware attack on their systems. 
that means any aspect of our lives could be affected. So really raise the bar of everyone is vulnerable and a mm -hmm. target. And it is important that no, in, so no CISO or CIO or even CEO can say, well, my company does, isn't important or we're not high enough profile right. or our, our, we have no, we have no secrets that anyone can steal. Everyone is, we're all part of this. And once you make that, that leap that we're all together in this environment of threat, it makes it a lot easier to start thinking, well, we should start sharing with each other so that we can get better. Cause let's face it, the adversaries are sharing information. They're learning oh, from absolutely. each other. They're collaborating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're only doing ourselves as an industry and as, and as a, as a world economy, a disservice from not doing better collaborations on the mitigations and on yeah. detection. Well, and you have affiliates that work for several different cyber gangs, right? Yeah. Like one single yeah. affiliate can work for Lockbit and black hat and all these other ones, right? Exactly. Whichever, whichever model will work that, that week is the one that they're going to get paid by. Interesting. So interesting. So a couple things come to mind. One, we've talked to several people from across the pond going east, uh, like the UK, and they talk about the difference between cultures and the difference between um, like the Americans view of our personal data compared to like the UK's view and and the people there view it as a fundamental human right. And here in America, we we've had just just a few years ago, we would meet with people, you know, Mark and I are in the Midwest. So we meet with business owners all the time. We heard that phrase so often that we're not we're not concerned about security. Like they <laughs> want to do the minimum amount because they're not going to target us. And now they're not going to come in. That has changed to where it's almost like, well, I'm sure they're going to hit us, but it probably won't be that bad. Like that whole journey that, that realization is slowly coming but it's it's not fast enough for their own benefit yeah um what 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 are you seeing like you you see things across you know you do things involving allies and all of that like what are you seeing um in terms of do, do, do you recognize any cultural difference on the value of the way we perceive our own data it, it is interesting and i don't think it's any one particular thing that led to that you know that dichotomy i think partly and, and we saw this early in the industry a difference between the security measures that the eu and the uk were taking versus what we see in america right some of that had to do with the liability protections if right. your credit card was compromised in the eu you were on the hook for what it got used for back in the day yep. in the us you had a 50 dollar liability that interesting built -in protection, okay which sounds like a yeah. good thing it's a good thing i don't want to get hit for every time my my credit card gets uh hacked sure the flip side is, is that I really don't value my credit card that much other than the pain it is to go switch it out of all my accounts that are using it. Oh, that's a good point. From because a personal level, from a personal that's a great level, point. We don't have the same, uh, oh my God, if my data gets out there, what's going to happen? Because the, the pain is minimal. Similarly, when we look at it from a perspective you know, of the EU having the GDPR, but it really behind that, the we're going to protect data. We're going to have sovereignty of data across the, the EU countries, we didn't, we don't have that in the States. I mean, it's, oh. we're all the United States and we just expect everything's going to be protected. And that's somebody else's problem. Mm -hmm. The EU took a very forward leaning view of how, you know, did the data right, the idea of mm -hmm. a right to privacy. And that led to things like the right to forget and the right to, you know, the control that they wanted to put in. Right. We never saw that, you know, we've had a couple of States come up with data privacy requirements and reporting requirements. Um, but it was never done at the federal level. And so again, you don't have the same regulatory environment. You're going to get different outcomes. Um, the flip side, you can always tell you, someone can be really, really concerned about a hacker getting their personal information, but they'll give it all away on the social media platform. Well, I was just about to say it, it, a lot of this even came to fruition in the hearing over TikTok, right? Yeah. Because they were, they were talking about it and they were so aghast by what TikTok was doing. And yet we don't have regulations like GDPR no. here. Right. And it's like, well, and, and other social media platforms are kind of doing the exact same thing that TikTok was doing and they don't have as good of an algorithm, which is why TikTok's winning. And then the issue, right. And then the issue yeah. is, is, well, you know, there's China. So, uh, you know, there's just natural suspect for, for valid reasons. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah. Because we, we sit here and curate our lives on social media, um, much more so than they do overseas. 
exactly. And I think that that those are contributory factors. And I think mm -hmm. also, you know, again, it's one of those good thing, good news, bad news parts. You know, we're, we're very, right. very forward leaning on our capitalism that each company is going to do what it needs to do to, to win. And anything that you, any additional regulation you put on it, it's yeah. going to stymie innovation, which is true in certain respects. But again, what that leads you to is that it's, uh, I expect the company to protect my data. Right. And when they don't, you get upset. But really, how many people have left XYZ Bank or whatever retail store because their data was compromised? Um, right. You just don't see the mass exodus. So the, 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 at the end of the day, one of the things that when you look at sort of what changes security in a large organization or small is when the, 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 their, their customers use their money where they're, you know, to, to make a decision to, to push a policy or push a, uh, a well, priority. it's true, right? Because, because at the end of the day, when you work for a company, you're not working for the company, you're working for the customer's money. Exactly. Right. And, and so when customers leave because they lose trust that they're not going to lose their confidential information and ruin their credit score. Like we always talk about, like at the end of the day, security is, I want to be able to buy a jacket without it ruining my FICO score. Can we right. do that? If we can manage that, I love your brand, yeah. right? Like if we can do that, it's one simple thing, then that's a good thing. But some organizations don't value the their own data and then it jeopardizes us who just want to buy a jacket and not get, yeah. not have 10 years of having to fill out a bunch of forms when we're buying a house or whatever, right? And having to say, no, that wasn't me and that wasn't me and all this other stuff, right? And rebuilding your credit score because that's a, that's something that will drive you to never do business with that organization. Yet. Exactly. And I think we've also hit a little bit of fatigue. I mean, you can't go you know? a week without a major data breach. I know it, it, it becomes noise almost. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then, and then it loses its impact. Yeah. Come desensitized to it. Yeah. I yeah. used to have a slide where I had like every major compromise or data breach with a, you know, like the article and for about six months, I did a pretty good job of trying to keep everything on one side, and I just gave up. It was yeah. <laughs> we used to be able to talk about Target. don't have a slide big enough. Yeah, <laughs> Make a bigger Remember, slide. Mark, yeah, you know, Mark and I have done the security awareness trainings for over a decade, part of InfoGuard and stuff. Yep. And we, we've you know, we used to talk about Target, and we used to talk about Equifax, and you know, like poster child of what not to do if you're breached and stuff. There's so many now. It's just like, what do you guys? What what would be most relevant to you? What story yeah. do you want to hear? Pick an industry, and we can yeah, tell you. Pick an breach. industry. We've got we've got a million of them here, right? And I think one of the things that's lost in a lot of the noise is that many of the organizations that are getting breached had what we would call industry best practice in cyber hygiene. Mm -hmm. They they had the firewalls, they had security yeah. tools, they had the alerts, and oftentimes it comes down to one of two things: they had the systems that would have detected it, but no either no one was watching or they weren't configured correctly. So exactly. time and again, it's the blinking light going off and no one's there to catch it. It's alert fatigue alert yeah. or, or, or configuration, right? They yeah. don't have, they might have FireEye, but they don't have the automatic remediation set or whatever it is, right? And I, th I think that's one of the things, you know, when I'm talking to CIOs, I, I, the, the joke I use is that you'd much rather automate the security fix, the patch and break the CEO's email for 30 minutes. Yes. Then have another data breach. And that's yep. the, th the mentality. And this again, zero trust is an, only an aspect of it. The other piece is automation, because the only way you scale, whether it be zero trust or supply chain security or any of these other concepts, is if you can automate most everything that I call the stupid stuff. And I'm not saying right. that anyone's job is right. stupid, right. but 80% of what you do could be automated. And then you can take your small cyber team, which are never going to have enough people to patch everything and focus them on that, that threat hunting or on that 20% right. hard problem. or fixing that one server that you can't automate because it's so legacy, it needs handholding. Right. And by do, turning on automated process to push out patches, to close vulnerabilities, to flip on firewall rules and make that, uh, get the human out of the loop faster, A, closes vulnerability quicker, but B, frees you up to go focus on those harder problems, which is that other area where they got in through something that no one thought about. That's and that's because no one has time to go think about those other areas. Yeah. No, that's that's really insightful. I love I love that I love that perspective. And then honestly, then you can focus on building a security culture because then you can harden the people. You can focus on training the people and bringing you know everybody. Every brand has a culture. Everybody, and yet they'll do security awareness when they onboard, and then maybe once 
once a year, once, once a year. And then maybe there's an email on Tech Tuesday where nobody knows whether anybody's read it or whether it's resonated or whether they've read it that Tuesday. And that will actually change behavior because it resonated with them three months later. Like yeah. there's 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 it needs to be ongoing and everything else, because um, even with the automation, it's still going to it's still going to fall down when we let them in because yeah. we're not trained or we we don't know what what to look for. Yeah. And David, so, one thing I would, you know, like I, there's a there's been this mentality that we need to make every user a security guru. Yeah, that's not going to happen. And actually, that's what not going to happen. Trust if we could just saying is that yeah. you shouldn't have to. Right. If we really had once we get, let's say, far enough down that marathon journey of zero trust, a user could click on the link every morning. Right. And, and it wouldn't do anything. Potentially get affected for a second. And there's right. that malware may even download. But if I've really built my zero trust enterprise to the, the the means that we're talking about, that malware would actually not be able to do anything. And so like and I quote my uh my 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 mentor Bruce Schneier, you know, let them click on the dancing pigs, because they will click right. on the dancing pigs every time. Yeah. And if your environment doesn't just implicitly trust things, then that dancing pigs that is a malware won't be able to get its foothold. And that's where we need to right. get to and what zero trust is a start on. I would agree. And yet well, we still are dealing with 90% of all the organizations still don't even have the fundamentals in yeah. place. And so I love that because that's where we need to get. In the meantime, we still have to train people not to click Absolutely. on the dancing pigs. <laughs> we exactly. still get, don't click on the dancing like don't, we don't still have to we still have to find the needle in the haystack and just no when you see that don't do that oh i didn't know like okay let's <laughs> explain why you shouldn't because the other systems aren't in place it's not automated yet yeah. right for and I'm, I'm talking like in the smb space mm -hmm. absolutely and and they think you know there there are some really cool services i know we do it and others do it where you get the, you know, like every once in a while, everyone gets a little, a phishing. Email. Oh yeah. The, the test oh, yeah. phishing service. Yeah. 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 We, 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 we provide those to clients. It's, Absolutely. It's and I think the thing that really trains people isn't the, you know, little pop-up window that says, oh, you got fish. You should have done right. it. It's when you have to sit through an hour of training because of it. <laughs> oh yeah. I guarantee you that changes behavior fast. I will tell David, you. remember we had the one client that actually wrote it into their HR policies. If there were a X number of failed phishing attempts, you know, that they clicked on within a quarter or whatever the time frame was, there was, there was, um, some like consultation, some a sit down wow. with HR and leadership. Yeah. And there was a discussion about what, like, why do you keep clicking on this? I will tell you, I will tell you, and this is a true story it happened today. I got one, right. And it was, there was nothing more exciting than I see one and it looks really good. It was I a mean, good it one. Is right it was a really good expense. one. It was right from our expense system. Mm. It looks so real. Like there was no red flags on there. And I thought about the context and I'm like, I haven't even done my expenses for June. Like I have no reason to be getting this. So <laughs> I sent it off and the head of our expenses said, this is not us. Like, thank you for not clicking on that. I'm like, Wow. I'm like, I felt so good noticing that. I'm like, see, this is, it's, you know, there's like a motivation. I'm like, now I don't have to sit in an hour class. Like, this is great. <laughs> I don't have to get a call from HR to, to get a call sign HR. some letter of warning. Dude, why are you working from Starbucks again? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't, don't do that. Right. So Steve, thank you so much. This, oh, is, this was great, man. Thank this you. so much insight. Yeah, I was telling, was really I was telling Mark just like, you're, you're the, where you sit in your experience, it's so impactful for our listeners and for, um, for, for Mark and I to, to, to hear about. And I, and I really agree. And like, I really, I really value that, that view that once we can get organizations up that journey toward, towards zero trust and, uh, increase automation that the other parts really will kind of begin to get us to where we can have shields that matter up right yeah exactly. i really buy into that so that's phenomenal um it's good stuff steve any what what is what is coming up next for you um is there are you are you speaking anywhere our our listeners can come see you um what else do you have coming up in the near future so i think the 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 things that i'm doing um i'll be speaking at the mit cdoiq conference coming up in july uh, oh. talking about AI and some of the impacts, both from a security and from a uh, just enterprise perspective, what we need to do better on. 
Mm -hmm. uh, if anyone wants to find me, I will be at Black Hat DEF CON this year. So come by and we'll have a drink. I'm happy to talk to anyone. Excellent. Uh, it will be a fun time there getting back to that now that COVID's over and we can start going places yep. again. Um, that's fantastic. So yeah, looking that's, forward to it. That's that's outstanding. Um, well, Steve Oren, thank you so much for joining. Um, uh, I hope this is not the last time we talk because I would love after hearing your uh, your presentation on on AI, we could have done an entire episode. Uh, that's, on, I've got a whole list on, of questions. I yeah, we, we, we really do because <laughs> because the the responsible use of it, mm. the 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 looking the you know, there's so much there and it just is changing every single day. So um, I, again, Steve Oren, connect with them on LinkedIn. Um, uh, uh, Check them out. We'll have uh, your information uh, um, in our show notes. Uh, so we encourage everybody to uh, follow you and uh, learn. So thank you thank, so much. Thank, thank you, Mark, you so David. much. Sir. Oh thank yeah. You, Thanks, sir. Steve. Look our for pleasure. Next time. Talk soon. Well, that wraps this up. Thanks for joining everybody. Hope you got value out of digging deeper behind the scenes of security and cybercrime today. Please don't forget to help keep this going by subscribing free to our YouTube channel at Cybercrime Junkies Podcast and download and enjoy all of our past episodes on Apple and Spotify podcasts so we can continue to bring you more of what matters. This is Cybercrime Junkies, and we thank you for joining us.